Hello, everyone, and welcome to the New Earth Lawyer podcast. My name is Geraldine Jones Putra. I am your host. I'm a lawyer based in Melbourne, Australia. Today, I have with me Chamundai Curran from New South Wales, Australia. Chamundai was a lawyer for 25 years, and she always felt called to help others and to serve. She initially helped others as a family lawyer, but after many years, Chamundai felt called to help in a different way. Eventually, being a traditional lawyer was no longer a fit. She has spent more than 30 years immersed in Indian spiritual tradition. She gained the name Chamundai, given by her spiritual teacher. It means strength, courage, and dispelling darkness. Chamundai now coaches and mentors lawyers and professionals who are interested in spirituality, who feel called to look more deeply into life and their purpose. She is the owner of The Laughter Lawyers, a training organization for wellness, personal effectiveness, relationship building, conflict resolution, and coaching and mentoring programs. Chamundai, welcome to the show. It's, a, it's great to have you. Thank you, Geraldine. So good to be here and have the opportunity to catch up and to speak. Mm, thank you. So where we're going to start, given the intro, I think... I want to delve into your background. Uh, there's a bit in there that has some kind of juicy possibilities. So I'm, I'm going to start, though, before we get into the Indian traditions with the traditional bit, the part where you say it just wasn't a fit anymore. You were a family lawyer and then it just wasn't a fit. So tell us about that. Yeah, so I definitely started life as a traditional lawyer and I actually loved the law and law school and was so excited to be like one of those TV um, stars who went to court and found out the truth, um, except I found out when I went to court it wasn't necessarily about finding the truth and I found I had many, many clients, not only family law clients but in other areas of law that I worked in where even though we won their court cases, they weren't happy. And I was really puzzled by that. And I had loved litigation and court work and I did work a lot in family law. So that was the area that I mainly practiced in. And these clients seemed so unhappy at the end of their legal case, even when they'd achieved everything they told me that they wanted. And I was really puzzled about what else is going on. And I felt like the legal system wasn't the structure that could help me enough to help them because I felt like they were calling for something else and I was giving them a legal solution and yet the legal solution didn't fix, especially in family law, of course, mm. the legal solution is not necessarily a solution to the maybe the pain or the, the hurt that's under the problem and that's driving them to find a lawyer in the first place. So the cases that I had and the people and the clients that I had seemed to be looking for something more and I started to yearn inside me, how can I really help these people in a deeper way? The legal training that I'd had, I felt didn't equip me to really support all of what they needed. So then I delved into an amazing um kind of journey into counselling, which of course was self, uh, self-reflection self and personal development of myself because as I trained to be a counsellor and I spent many years in Lifeline, which is a fabulous, fabulous training ground, uh, of course what I uncovered was all of my own inner self and I felt just like my clients that I had been almost like two people, like they would come to me like, here's my legal problem, but under it, here's my personal issues that are driving my legal problem. Mm. I, as a lawyer, was like this legal persona, very logical, very, I will fix this, you know, I'll get into the legal solutions. But when I stepped into Lifeline and I stepped into the counselling world, I stepped into the other half of myself. And so my emotional self, and my um, more deeply into my spiritual self, which was happening alongside of this. And so then I was able to bring together a much deeper understanding of what's happening in the people 
And that's, I guess, my passion is what's happening in the person of the other lawyer, the client, you know, even the judge, whoever is involved, the counsellors. I'm very curious about what's happening in the people and the relationships. And so that's where my study went deep. And I suppose by saying to you, oh, let's start with talking about the lawyer stuff first, I've made a mistake of sorts that we tend to make in life, which is let's separate it out and let's talk about this part without talking about what was really going on and you've alluded to, which is your spiritual journey. Because you've said your spiritual journey began 30 years ago, which means it predates the lawyer journey. So forgive me, let's bring it all together, let's integrate. Tell, tell us what was going on there. And integrating is, is the really key word, I think, Geraldine, isn't it? Integrative yes. life and the law. Because yep. actually I started asking questions about God and, and what happens when you die when I was four years old. My mm. mother used to say, you just came and said one day, what happens when you die, Mum? <laughs> and my mum, bless her, said, well, if you're very good, you get to see God. <laughs> After which I told her that one of the boys in my preschool class would never get to see God because he was really naughty. <laughs> so clearly from a very young age I had an inner calling to know what is happening beyond the physical. Yeah. And definitely in my uh, teens, even when I went to uni, I was doing yoga um, and I was guided by friends and connections into the um, yoga ashram in Sydney that was very popular then, the Satyananda Yoga Ashram. It's still mm -hmm. going places. Uh, yeah. Its base was in Bihar in India. And I was lucky enough in my early 20s that the guru from that school, Swami Satyananda, uh, came and he was quite an older man. Back This is back in the 80s. And... He rarely travelled outside of India, but I was one of the lucky people in the group that he came to visit the ashram. And when I went there, it was like my heart exploded with love and mm. everything in me said, I've come home. Mm. So the music, the kirtan, the Sanskrit, I love Sanskrit. It's like I can learn long chants just by listening to them and repeating them and it just makes my heart on fire. Yeah. <laughs> It'll make me start to cry when I talk about mm -mm. how much my soul just ignited. And so I was so lucky with this master came and I was able to learn from him in my 20s. And I, and even though I was starting to be a lawyer in those days, I was in the early days of legal practice. I worked in Manly and I would ride my bicycle <laughs> from my legal job via the local ashram in Manly and I would stop off for my yoga and meditation class uh -huh. and so I was doing that in my 20s I was um but I did very much keep them separate in those days I probably I'm not sure if even people at work knew that that was my secret way home <laughs> yeah so you're talking about a time when those things were kept very separate particularly in professions like the legal profession now do you or did you at that point have any uh, understanding of reincarnation? Yes, I read one of the key moments on my spiritual journey was I was given the book, which is very famous, written by Paramahamsa Yogananda, Autobiography of a Yogi. And ah, most yes. spiritual, many spiritual seekers have read this book. And, of course, as you read that book, for me, there was a complete awakening. There was a soul awakening as I was reading it mm. because everything that I read, my inner self told me to be true. Mm. So I felt like I had lived in India. I knew what an ashram was like. I knew what it would be like to wear an orange robe and be like a monk. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was so familiar to me that it was, it was like that was the normal world and living in Western clothing in a normal house and driving a car and going to an office was the abnormal world. That was how I always felt. Yeah, uh, that's exactly why I asked you that question, because what you're describing sounds very much like a soul recognition that people talk about when they're associating with something that comes from a what we call a past life. Um, but it's resonating a lot in this one for some reason. 
we supposedly have many, many past lives, but there are some that come into or bleed through into this one it's more strongly than others. And it certainly sounds like the connection with the Indian and the yogic tradition was coming yeah. through. That was that was like my home base. I kind of don't even think about past lives as being separate mm. because time is not linear in the way that we perceive it to be. So I kind of think of it more as an opening into universal knowledge that everyone has access to, that everyone can find their piece of that knowledge that resonates in their heart. So for me, it might in our language be a past life because in this physical time period of my physical being here, I haven't lived as a monk. Yeah. But it's familiar because it's part of the fabric of what is possible and it's happening in other places. So, you know, our life force is the same in every person on the planet and in every piece of nature in my understanding and, and in what I've learned and been taught. Mm, mm. And so it's almost like you can open a doorway into another piece of consciousness and you can experience what it would be like to be a monk or to be a priest or to be a rabbi or you know to be in a Jesus or yeah you know whatever your flavor is so that's what it was like for me it was like I remembered something that I just forgot because I just forgot <laughs> mm. we're all yeah. one all is literally one so it is yeah. just like you said if you could if you found the way to open the channel into that aspect of self, because it's just an aspect of self, because we all are one, whether it's a bit, it's a, something in a different place, which is also just a, an illusion or a different time, another illusion, we have access to it. It's just being human beings on this particular plane, three-dimensional, we don't That's know right. it. And I think the other thing that happened during that time is I realised that everything that I'd always thought was normal, not everybody around me thought was normal. Mm. So it would be normal for me to walk into a courtroom that was crowded with 50 people and know who was my client that I'd never met before and never spoken to. But I would be able to walk up to them and go, oh, you're so-and-so. Because I don't know, it's, it's the intuition that we all have yeah. that for me was part of my everyday existence and yeah. then I didn't ever question how did I know that because, you know, and miracles of healing that would happen sort of around me as well. I never questioned them because they were, that was the norm. Mm. And so even in my legal cases, when clients were open to it, we would speak about healing and I think what came in later as I got deeper into the spirituality and realised that was who I was and being a lawyer was an additional role I could play if I wanted to, then clients could have access and other lawyers can have access if they want to those hidden dimensions that we often don't see because they're not physically visible, but they're certainly working with us all the time. And everyone's had those feelings of, the phone rings and you have a sense of who it is. Oh, yes. I was just thinking about you. You know, who all of all of us have picked up the phone and gone, oh, I was just thinking about you. Well, you know, that's that's the unseen dimensions. Mm. Yeah. Because going back to what we were saying, a part of you was thinking about you. So how could you not pick up on it? Um so what I wanted to, to delve into now is, okay, you talked earlier about the getting into counselling. So you didn't do that in an uninformed way. By that I mean you had an understanding that there was something else to your life, something deeper, which is the spiritual side. And then when things were happening with your clients and you were seeing that they were unhappy or, or completely unresolved, even though their legal conflict might have been resolved, you went into counselling. That must have been a decision you made because you could see that there, you needed a solution to to what you were seeing. That is what you would expect, Geraldine. But actually, it was <laughs> kind of, I kind of got tricked into it in a bizarre way. This is too funny. Um, one of my friends said to me, 
oh, look, you, you know, you're fed up, you're looking for something else, go to this course. That's all she said to me is just enroll in this course. And because I trusted her and she'd been a long-term friend, I just enrolled in this course. And to be honest, I didn't fully understand what it was until I got there. Yes. <laughs> and then they said, this is lifeline telephone counselling. And I went, you're what? <laughs> oh, you were literally and tricked. I literally, it was like a divine trick because if someone had said to me, you're going to go and counsel people on the phone, I would have run a mile. But because it was kind of presented as this will help you get clear about what you want to do in your life, that's what my friend said to me. <laughs> then I went in. But when I went in, what struck me was these beautiful people who cared about everyone, that like they hugged you and they asked you how you were feeling and so it took only five minutes before I was hooked and quite happy to be a telephone counsellor. And then, yes, it wasn't long before I realised that was exactly what my clients needed. But I, I didn't consciously go, I need to find counselling to help them, even though you would think that's what I would have done. <laughs> I yeah. <laughs> you know what else is occurring to me? That you're working in family law. And this is the most traumatic aspects of people's lives coming out, you know, some of the most traumatic aspects of their lives coming out, divorce and separation, marriage breakdown. And you being a lawyer, hugging people and being yeah. getting into to their emotional needs wasn't it wasn't part of, of your training. It just wasn't part of your professional portfolio. You had to go into the counseling world to see it. I had something yeah. similar to me when I began to do more work around um, corporations that were looking to do purpose-led work. Now, as a corporate lawyer, we don't talk about such things. We talk about the, the corporate laws or duties. And then if we're doing transactions, we talk about the financials. But then I had to get into that world to see people really talk about caring. And I had that feeling that you're talking about the, one of the first events I went to which was a B Corporation event, people were talking in terms of really wanting to, to do good and, and help the world and help each other. And, and I, w I had that moment of, like, my God, there is another way that, you, that I could do business, which is deeply, deeply personal and heartfelt. Yeah. That's it. It's heartfelt. And when I first um, was on the phones at Lifeline, I had another epiphany, which was I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to have all the answers because uh -huh. the beautiful way that we were trained was to be reflective and listen to the clients in that person-centred Rogers sort of way. Like, so one, they didn't know who I was because it was we were anonymous. And secondly, I listened to them and at the end of an hour of listening, they had come up with solutions and they would tell me how amazing they felt. And I would be sitting there thinking, I haven't done anything. But, of course, what I've done is I've held the space for them to work through their issue. And that gave me a whole different dimension then on what I wanted to do, which then led me into mediation. So I trained in, in mediation um, because, of course, that allows a container for people then to resolve their own uh, problems without going to court so that was starting to suit my personality and my heart a lot more and restorative justice I worked in restorative justice and I worked for indigenous organizations and um, you know I went into places that were holistic I worked for community legal centers yeah and yeah so that was where I started to feel more like I could pull together my legal training and I could develop the counselling side and be able to listen to people and not have to have the solutions until a solution is what is a, sometimes legal solutions are what is needed um but mostly people have their own solutions yeah so they were they all came together the or i guess they're still coming together because because it's such a beautiful um uh, poetry right when you bring the strands of your life together to integrate they're all dynamic so they're constantly moving around and actually because you at least they're all there it is a beautiful dance so you get to 
play with them and, and mold them together. Is that what you're finding? So it's that, you know you could yeah. have gone and, okay, I've got all the pieces now, and then in a very human way try and put them all in their place. But yeah. are, you, are you still playing with them, and how is that happening? I think that's true. And of course, the other major strand that came in um, was the laughter. Ah, uh, you know, so that came in as a massive. Um, a very funny story. I was driving home because after all this, I went to work at the Workers' Compensation Commission in New South Wales as an arbitrator, so you couldn't have anything more legal and fixed. But along the way, I had developed the spirituality and I developed the people skills and I'd, I then fell into the laughter yoga because I was driving home from a case one day and I was again getting fed up with the legal system and frustrated with it all and clients not being happy again inside this system, injured workers. And so I literally said this prayer in the car, please, God, what do you want me to do? I'm so mm. sick of being a lawyer. Mm. And instantly into my head came this idea, start a laughter club. <laughs> Did you laugh start when you heard a it? Laughter club. And then it was silence. And it was like, what the heck is that? Yeah. I had never heard of laughter clubs. I didn't know such a thing existed. And I knew it wasn't about comedy. Like something in me knew it wasn't about go watch a comedy show. It's mm -hmm. It was so specific, start a laughter club. So I thought there must be such an, a, a thing must exist, a laughter club must exist, which, of course, I discovered that it did. It was laughter yoga started by an Indian medical doctor in India. Mm -hmm. And after starting in 1995 from five people in a park, it spread all over the world to hundreds and thousands of clubs. And it's in laughter yoga is practiced in hospitals and schools and corporations and, um, you know, prisons and everywhere, everywhere you can think of, there's laughter yoga groups, aged care facilities. Um, and they're groups so, who come together to practice laughter. Nothing. I think I've seen videos of this, people standing around in a park in a circle and just laughing, just, <laughs> just start laughing. And it looks so crazy. If you watch yeah. it, you think these people are mad. And that's what I thought when I went. The first one I went to, I just thought, oh, my gosh. But I was in Melbourne, funnily enough, in Williamstown. And so I was living up the north coast of New South Wales in Port Macquarie. So I couldn't go home. I was stuck in Melbourne with these mad laughing people. <laughs> <laughs> but again, by the time I'd done a couple of hours of this laughter workshop, I thought, how did the founder, Dr. Kataria, how did he get me from feeling like a serious lawyer to be rolling on the floor and laughing so hard that I was crying with people I'd never met before? I thought, how did he produce that transition and that transformation in me that I actually let myself do that because if someone it's even in when he spoke at the beginning he said you're going to be like rolling on the floor and I just thought well, don't be silly I won't be rolling on the floor I'm like a serious lawyer like I don't roll on floors <laughs> but I was rolling on the floor. <laughs> and then I realized that not only was the laughter yoga the funniest thing I'd ever done but I also realised that spirituality is the funniest thing you'll ever do and it's the most fun you'll ever have in your life. And so the strands then came together of spirituality is not this serious thing that you have to go and be silent like a monk forever. It's every day, every moment when you choose the high road, you know, you choose to be compassionate, you choose to let go the insult that somebody unless you feel you need to speak up and then you speak up with compassion and you speak your truth. But they're just, life is just becomes this fun, hilarious adventure. Yeah. Yeah, that aspect of just not taking it so seriously is one thing that lawyers are so trained not, not to do. You know, we, we, we have to take things seriously because this is... Yeah, our, our clients' interests, we have a duty. And trying to find the balance to tell lawyers, it's not about dereliction of duty. It's just about adding a levity to it that's actually going to make you a better lawyer. One of the I things know. I remember is my sister telling me that I was taking it all too seriously. And when I was working with a large law firm and I, I, I thought it was all very grand, 
Uh, and I was carrying it as a burden. And she said, you know, it's just a law firm. You're taking it too seriously. And that's one of those moments. She doesn't even remember saying it, but it's one of those moments where I went, it is just, it is just, it's just a job. It's just a law firm. It's just, just, just. And then the flip side of that is, so I can, I, I, it, the burden lifts and I can see it as what it is. And you add the laughter element, you can actually laugh at it. Yeah. And it's not disrespectful. Yeah. And it reminds me of, um, to digress into childhood, into Mary Poppins, there's that wonderful scene where they, they start laughing and they go up to the ceiling. Yes. And they're all floating around the ceiling. And it's only when they stop laughing that they fall to the ground. But that's a beautiful metaphor for the fact that laughter is one of the things that lifts our energy so that we actually can see from a higher perspective. So it's literally like you said that you walk, it's like walking upstairs above your problem and looking down on it and saying, oh, and not only do you look at the problem differently, but you see the resources that you can't see when you're in that blinkered um seriousness and and David Hawkins in his beautiful book Power Versus Force talks about the vibrational stages and the um, emotional stages that we evolve through and laughter is just the single easiest and fastest way I have found to shift my mood to bring focus to let go of stress to stop feeling anxious um, to become more creative. Mm, when I mm. started the laughter yoga, I would have creative ideas that I'd never had before. And um, physically, it does so many things for our physical health. It stops you having heart attacks. You know, it it clears the blood vessels. It lowers yeah. your blood pressure. Different it hormones would be released. And and so the blood on. sugar. Like it's mm. been effective in diabetes, in heart mm. attacks, in depression, like Anything you name that the physical body or the mental system does, it fixes emotional conflict because when you learn to laugh for yourself, and I'm not talking about laughing at the person. <laughs> other person. Yeah, yeah. Which when is why you, you brought to... in that thing about it's not comedy because comedy no. often has that element of laughing at somebody. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons Dr. Kataria um, stopped using jokes because when he first started laughter clubs he did use jokes to generate the laughter because that was the only way he knew how but what happened was the people started getting offended by the jokes and mm. in India in the 1990s especially the women were very traditional and they didn't like rude jokes or racist jokes or and they said we don't like the jokes stop the laughter club and he said well we can't stop the laughing let's just stop the jokes and so he then developed physical exercises and he found by faking the laughter, they laughed more than with the jokes because if you tell a joke and then you tell it again and again and again, not funny. Mm. So where do you get your laughter from? So if I said, let's cough, <coughs> let's sneeze, achoo, let's laugh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> You're making me laugh too. It's a natural. <laughs> it's a natural activity. It's just like yeah. breathing with sound. <laughs> Yeah. How do you bring it into your work? Tell me about the laughter lawyers. Yeah, so what I do is I have a really beautiful system of helping people to move from that stressed place and that feeling like they just don't know what to do and they, they feel like they're being called for something higher and something more, like I was. I have steps and a pathway to take them through to find that joy, to find a deeper understanding of their own emotional selves, to find um, mental clarity, to be able to step through their knowledge of their own energy field and how they can really, um, oh, what's the word? It's like how to um, manage or change the so energy alchemize, system. transform something. Yeah, alchemize or transform it. So that's mute, perhaps. And yeah, so that it's serving them. So mm -hmm. let's just say I'm going to do something that I and I start to get a bit of fear. And then I might go, okay, what are my tools? Maybe 
I'm not very grounded at the moment because I'm feeling anxious. So my energy has gone to my head, but I know that I'm more stable if my energy is in my feet and in the lower part of my belly. And I have learned some tools and mudras to help me and some mantras, sacred mantras to help me be grounded. And so in two minutes, I can transform myself from feeling anxious to feeling grounded, centered, my nervous system aligns and I've got all of my brain working, you know, I'm not in fight and flight. And so we have these beautiful steps that um, I take people through. So in the end, they become the master. They don't need me anymore. They become the master of their own energy and their own destiny, which is where we all want to get to, right? Like we're, we're autonomous. We're all connected to spirit and the soul. We just sometimes forget and we need each other. So it builds community because I think integrative law, spiritual lawyers, you know, we need each other because the predominant kind of way that the legal system operates, I guess, in the world is still not necessarily meditating every day. It's definitely getting more that people are realising they need those tools. But I see I'm it as, as building a separate consciousness yeah. because and as we come together, to... we solidify a, a separate consciousness of different paradigm and alternative to, to doing things. That's right. And, and then people can choose. They may stay as the traditional lawyer doing the exact same job, but they're doing it like they've laughed their way to the ceiling, mm -hmm. like the Mary Poppins thing. It's mm -hmm. like they're sitting up there even though they're sitting with their clients and they've got all of these resources and inner resources and inner knowledge and inner wisdom that will just come through them and, you know, things then change for their clients in really different ways. Are and you seeing a change in the, the people who are coming to you? Are you seeing more lawyers? More, yes, definitely there are more lawyers. I mean, think of the, you know, we're both part of the integrative law movement. Yeah. And when we look at, um, you know, thank you, Kim Wright, for her amazing work. And in her books, Lawyers as Peacemakers, in particular, there's stories about all the lawyers doing things differently. Mm. And, um, yeah, if I ever forget and think I'm the only one, then, you know, I look around at our community and I realise, no, there's lots of us. And so I do think, and, of course, I took a lovely group of lawyers to India before we were not allowed to travel. <laughs> and so they met my teacher in India and they met Amma. Um, there's been a few of us who've been over there. So they're all, of course, out doing their thing. Um, you know, we stay in touch, but they have found their way to kind of follow the dreams of their hearts and yeah. whatever that might be. Sometimes it's in the law, sometimes it's out of the law, but those people are definitely still in the legal world, yeah. I agree with you that... It, it is just about giving giving tools to people and then allowing them to choose with their own free will whether they want to make the change out of traditional law practice or they want to stay in it but with a different perspective. What do you think, though, is the future? I'm not looking forward very far. I'm just saying the next two to five years for the integrative law movement and for spiritual lawyers I would hope that it's going to grow in numbers and that um, more and more lawyers will realise that all that happens when you open to your spiritual self is that you become much better at whatever it is you want to do. You become kinder, you become smarter, you become more focused, more successful. Your priorities change and so you might go down some unexpected avenues but if you do you'll find that it brings so much joy and fulfillment and so um and one of my business coaches says you know it's when we're off track to our uh what are our values and what we love to do when we get off track the universe gives us a lot of feedback and a lot of hard stuff happens you know because it's it's trying to realign us to where we were always in our hearts wanting to go. Yeah. So, you know, you might talk to a lawyer and find they just are so passionate about art, but they hardly have time to do their artwork. But when they're doing their artwork, time stops and they just love it. Well, what if they're not separate things? 
You know, what if that self that loves the art and the self that is a good lawyer come together? So that's for me, it's, it's, and I feel like we need community to, to support ourselves through that journey because it's not a journey alone. No one gets to, uh, even to be a really good lawyer, you need mentors and teachers and everyone who's great will have had someone else who taught them. It's kind of how life is. Yeah, and it's not so necessarily a, a role model to show you what you want to be. This is this is one of the issues I have with, with role models and people who look for role models. You don't necessarily want to be what that person is. That person's just showing you another path, other possibilities. You might take some of that on, but it's up to you to make it your own because your life is your life path is unique. And I think that you're doing that really well through the laughter lawyers and through yeah, your own you. journey. And I agree, Geraldine. I think every great teacher will want you to be who you are, not who they are. Yes. Every yeah. great teacher. Even my teacher in India, Shakti Narayani Amma, I once asked Amma, you know, should Chamunda come and stay? Should I come and stay here and live here? And the first thing Amma said to me is, what does Chamunda want to do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was so beautiful. It was like there was no this is what you must do. It's like what is your heart calling you to do? Yeah. And every time I've ever asked a question, it's always been either hmm, everything's being taken care of or what do you want? Yeah, we are and all so, our own leaders. I think the greatest question we can ask ourselves is what do I really want? What is my heart really calling me to do? Mm. Yeah, Shamunda, and thank you so much. I think that that's just a beautiful note to, to finish up on. I, I wish you all the best with your laughter lawyers and I'm going to incorporate more laughter into my life after speaking with you. Thank you for that. It's a pleasure.